Hello, my name is Jonathan Chapman. I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester, and this is my talk on the Ramsey number of the Brouwer configuration. Everything I talk about today is joint work with Sean Prenderville at Lancaster University. This talk is being recorded for the Junior Mathematician Research Archive, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the GMRA for giving me the opportunity to speak. So I'm gonna start with this quite general setup. We take the positive integers and we color them with finitely many colors. So maybe one is red, two is red, three is blue, four is green, and so on. And we're gonna look for monochromatic arithmetic structures which emerge. These are patterns which are all of one color. Schur's theorem tells us that no matter how we color the positive integers, there must exist x, y, and z, all the same color, such that x plus y equals z. Van der Weyden's theorem tells us that there are arbitrarily long monochromatic arithmetic progressions. In other words, for every positive integer k, there exists a monochromatic set of the form x, x plus d, all the way up to x plus k minus 1 times d. And a set of this form is called a k-term arithmetic regression with common difference d. Now, as it turns out, you don't actually have to color all of the positive integers before you start seeing these monochromatic structures appearing. And this was actually proven by both Schur and van der Weyden in these cases. So in fact, we have the following quantitative versions of their theorems. And I'm gonna focus on van der Weyden's theorem here. Van der Weyden proved that given positive integers k and r, there exists a quantity wrk, such if you color one, two, three, all the way up to wrk with r different colors, then you obtain a monochromatic k-term progression. So you see that we do not have to color all of the positive integers, just up to n for n sufficiently large. And a notoriously difficult problem in arithmetic Ramsey theory is to find good bounds for these numbers wrk, these van der Weyden numbers. How large do they have to be in terms of r and k? And it took around 60 years before it was proven in 1988 by Scheller that you can even obtain reasonable bounds on these quantities. Scheller proved that these numbers are primitive recursive. And the best bounds we currently have for general R and K are due to Gowers, who proved that WRK is at most 2 to the 2 to the R to the 2 to the 2 to the K plus 9. In other words, if you color 1, 2, all the way up to this large number with R different colors, then you obtain a monochromatic k-term progression. It's a very famous open problem in this area to try and improve this result, to get a smaller number to have this conclusion. But the main result of today's talk is the following generalization of both Schur's theorem and van der Weyden's theorem due to Brouwer. So Brouwer proved that given positive integers k and r, there exists a number brk, such if you color one up to brk with r different colors, then not only do you obtain a monochromatic k-term progression, but you can also get such a progression where the common difference has the same color as well. And our main result is that one can obtain a Gowers-type bound for the Brouwer number brk. Uh, this Brouwer number brk and the van der Weyden number wrk in a more general context are referred to as the Ramsey numbers for these problems. Uh, this is an analogy with Ramsey's theorem from graph theory. Before I get into some of the methods involved in these results, I just want to talk about some further work in this direction. So I mentioned that Gower's bound is the best we have for general R and K. However, for small R and K, one can obtain improvements. For example, if R and K are both very small, then you could use a computer and calculate the number exactly. What's the exact number at which point this conclusion holds? But suppose you're only interested in one aspect of this result. So we've got the number of colors varying and the length of the progression varying. We've got R and we have K. And maybe you just want to fix one of these and let the other one vary. So maybe you're only interested in three term progressions, say, or four term progressions, but you want to see what happens when the number of colors varies. And we have an improvement of this kind for when you're looking at three term progressions with common difference. So when K equals three. And our improvement comes from some work of Green and Tao, who were looking at four-term progressions in Semiradi's theorem and consequently obtained um, improvements for four-term progressions in van der Weyden's theorem. And by utilizing their methods, we were able to obtain this improvement for three-term progressions with common difference in Brouwer's theorem. So if we go back to the previous slide, you see that our general bound in Brouwer's theorem is double exponential in some large power of the number of colors R. 
for k equals three, we improve this to double exponential in r log squared r. So we bring this large power of r down to almost one. So this is almost exactly at the double exponential barrier, which seems to be the limit of current methods. And I also want to mention some work of Tom Sanders from the University of Oxford, who obtained the following more general result than our result independently of our work. So what Sanders proves is that if you have uh, a system of linear equations, a linear homogeneous equations, uh, with the property that they have monochromatic solutions under any finite coloring of the positive integers. So an example, examples of this are, for example, x plus y equals z, which was Schur's theorem, and K-term progressions, van der Weyden's theorem, and also the K-term progressions with common difference, Brouwer's theorem. Um, then given such a system, what he proves is that for a number of colors r, you only need to color one up to double exponential in some large power of r with r different colors in order to obtain a monochromatic solution. So in other words, the associated Ramsey numbers are double exponential in some large power of the number of colors. So this, as I say, this result is more general than our result. However, the difference is that our result also tells you what happens if you fix the number of colors and vary the length of the progression. We have this quintuple exponential dependence on the length of the progression k, as in Gower's bound. Whereas this result is focused on the color aspect. What happens when you fix a system of equations and you vary the number of colors? And for completeness, I'll just mention that um, we have a thorough understanding of which systems of equations have this coloring property. That is, when you color the positive integers, you always get a monochromatic solution. And this was worked out by Rado, who's actually a student of Schur. And the criterion that he obtained, I've, I've written a version of this down at the bottom of the slide. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit about the methods involved in proving these results. And what, the first, I'll, I'll start with the fact that Gower's bound actually emerged as a corollary of his work on Semeredi's theorem, which is a far more general result than van der Weyden's theorem. So Semeredi proved that if you take a positive integer k and a density delta, then there exists a quantity s delta k, the Semeredi number, the associated Ramsey number, such that if n is at least as large as this number, and you take a subset of one up to n of density at least delta, then this subset must contain a k-term progression. Or to put it briefly, Semeredi's theorem proves that sets of positive upper density must contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And Gowers obtained the following quantitative version of this result, showing that the associated Ramsey number takes this familiar form. And you can observe that Van der Weyden's theorem follows immediately from Semeredi's theorem. This is because if you color one up to n with r different colors, the color that appears the most frequently has density at least one over r. So in particular, if you take delta to be one over r in both Semeredi's theorem and Gower's theorem, we recover respectively van der Weyden's theorem and Gower's bound in van der Weyden's theorem. However, unfortunately, we don't have a density version of Brouwer's theorem. And this is due to the fact that the odd numbers have density of half However, any progression in odd numbers must have an even common difference. And this comes from the fact that if you add two odd numbers together, you get an even number. Nevertheless, the methods that Gower's introduced are very helpful for this line of inquiry. So our general strategy will be as follows. We're going to take a positive integer k, the length of the progression we're looking for, and we're going to fix a set b. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for k-term progressions whose common difference lies in b. And then later, we'll make an appropriate choice of B in order to ensure that the common difference, which lies in B, has the same color as the progression we obtain. And you'll notice that I've made sure that this set B, the elements of it are not too large. I've contained it in this interval N over 2K minus 2. And this is a minor technical point, And this comes down essentially to the fact that, for example, a K-term progression contained in 1 up to N must have common difference at most n over k minus one. And so we've halved that in order to ensure that the number of progressions that we count is fairly large. This is quite a minor technical point. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, in order to count these progressions, we're gonna introduce the following counting operator. What this does, is it takes a function defined on one up to n, taking values in zero, one, and it sums over all k term progressions with common difference in b and weights the terms by the function f. 
This is quite a technical construction. However, you'll notice that if we take f to be the indicator function of a set A, then this just gives the number of k-term progressions in A with common difference in B, where the indicator function is this function here, which takes the value 1 at a point in A and 0 otherwise. Now let's look at a kind of concrete example, or perhaps a probabilistic example, because this is quite common in uh, combinatorics, that we look at random constructions. So let's suppose we take a random subset of 1 up to n. And the way we're going to do this is we take some density delta, and we're going to choose each element of 1 up to n independently of any other to lie in our set S with probability delta. The resulting random set has expected size delta n, so it's expected density delta. Now, how many k-term progressions are there in S with common difference in our fixed set B? Well, a very simple probabilistic computation tells you that there are essentially as many as there probably could be. So there is about delta to the k times nb. And remember, there's about n times b such progressions in 1 up to n, so this is essentially within a factor of delta to the k, as many as there could possibly be. Now, that's a probabilistic construction. Let's look at something a bit more deterministic. And this is the reason that we introduced this uh, counting operator, so that we could look at functions rather than sets. So rather than look at this random set, let's look at the function delta times the indicator function of the whole interval. And if we plug that in to our definition of this counting operator, we recover the same number as we obtained for this expectation calculation. Again, showing that random sets contain many k-term progressions with common difference in B. So what this sort of tells us is that if our coloring is quite random, then we expect actually there to be a lot of k-term progressions which are monochromatic and have the same color as their common difference. And what this is going to tell us later is that we should focus instead on what happens when color classes are non-random or far from random. That's quite vague, and we're going to make sense of that in the next few slides. The point here, as I say, is that random sets contain many of these progressions. And what we're going to show shortly is that close to random sets also have many such progressions. But we need to make sense of what it means to be close to random. And I've already hinted at how to do that by introducing these functions, because although it doesn't quite make sense to talk about a set being close to a random set, it does make sense for a function to be close to this function delta 1n in some sense. So intuitively, one thing we'd like to be true is that if we've got two functions f and g, which are close in some sense, they, the sort of distance between them is very small, then we expect lambda k of f and lambda k of g to also be close. This is sort of a continuity argument, if you will. And this is made rigorous by the following result. And results of this kind uh, show up all the time in arithmetic Ramsey theory and arithmetic combinatorics. And it's known as a generalized von Neumann theorem. And what it says is that if we take this multilinear operator, this counting operator, and we look at the difference between lambda k of f and lambda k of g, it's bounded above by the distance between f and g in, as given by this norm, the Gower's uniformity norm, which I've defined below. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about what the Gower's uniformity norm actually is. What it is is a kind of average of f over s-dimensional parallel epipeds. But really what we're going to focus on is how this norm is used in these kind of results, rather than what it actually is. But perhaps I will say that for s equals 2, essentially what the Gower's norm is measuring is the size of the Fourier coefficients of f. Now for larger s, we delve into the subject of higher order Fourier analysis, which we won't talk about too much in this talk. But again, the point here is that if we have functions f and g that are close, according to the Gower's uniformity norm, then lambda k of f and lambda k of g are also close. And I suppose another way of saying this in a more technical way is that this multilinear operator lambda k is Lipschitz with respect to the Gower's norm. Okay, so now we can look at sets which are close to random. And as I said before, the way we're going to do this is replace sets with functions. So when looking at a random set of expected density delta, we looked at the function delta 1n. So if we want to look at a set 
and say that it is close to random, we should take its indicator function and say, and say that that is close to delta 1n. And since we've introduced the Gauss uniformity norm, that's how we're going to measure this distance. So we say that a set A of density delta is epsilon uniform of degree d if the difference between the indicator function of A and this delta 1n function in the Gauss ud plus 1 norm is at most epsilon times this power of n, which you shouldn't worry about too much, is essentially norm a normalizing factor coming from the definition of the Gauss norm. Sometimes the Gauss norm is defined slightly differently in order to avoid this uh, normalizing factor. But the point is, this is saying that A is within epsilon of being truly random, truly uniform or truly equidistributed in some sense. So now let's bring these ideas together and show how they help us with our result. So let's take a set A, which is epsilon uniform of degree k minus one, and let's take our set B and let's say that it has density beta. And if we apply the generalized von Neumann theorem from the previous slide, we obtain this bound by using the definition of a uniform set, because recall that um, that's, yes, yeah, so the generalized von Neumann theorem gives us this bound in terms of the uniformity epsilon. And now let's assume that A has the additional property that it does not contain any k term progressions with common difference in B. And that means that this lambda k 1a b number is zero. And so we then obtain a lower bound from a couple of slides ago when we calculated how many k term progressions of common difference in b lie in a random set, or we calculated how large lambda k of delta 1n b is. This gives us our this lower bound. And if you compare the lower and upper bounds, you see that they're essentially of the same order. And in particular, if we divide through by n squared, we see that the uniformity epsilon is at least beta times delta to the k over k times some constant. In other words, the uniformity epsilon is bounded away from zero, meaning that this set A cannot be too uniform. If it was sort of as uniform as we like, we could take epsilon as small as we wanted, we would obtain a contradiction here. So what this is telling us is it's telling us that very uniform sets must contain k-term progressions with common difference in B. And in fact, if you look at what happens when epsilon tends to zero in this result, you find that uniform sets have many k-term progressions with common difference in B. And so the point here is that we're going to need to look at what happens with non-uniform sets moving forward. Because if we could find a uniform set, which is monochromatic, then we could attempt to use this argument and we would be able to find a k-term progression, monochromatic, with the same color as its common difference by taking A and B to be sets of the same color. And let's, let's use that idea to give a sketch proof of our main theorem. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the quantities here. I'm just going to explain how Brouwer's theorem is proved using these ideas. So we take the interval 1 up to n, color with r different colors. And as I said before, if one of our color classes was fairly dense, so a density around 1 over r, um, and is sufficiently uniform, so it has its epsilon uniform for some very, very small epsilon, then we could apply the previous argument by taking A and B to be suitable subsets of CI, and that would give us a k-term progression with, contained in CI with common difference also in CI. In other words, a monochromatic k-term progression with common difference. However, unfortunately, this doesn't always happen. It is possible to define colorings in which the color classes are either non-uniform or the ones that are uniform are very, very small, very sparse. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to aim for something a little bit less. We're going to show a kind of local uniformity. We're going to look for a homogeneous progression. That is a progression of the form Q, 2 times Q, 3 times Q, and so on, up to M times Q, on which there is a, uh, for which there is a translate on which each color class is both dense and sufficiently random, uh, sufficiently uniform. So what this is saying is that there exists Q and M with M fairly large, such that each color class is both dense and very uniform on some progression of length M common difference Q. And the point here is that Q and M are the same for each color class. Now suppose that we found such Q and M, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple of slides. And so what this says is that the color class CI is both dense and epsilon uniform on a progression of length M, common difference Q. We now define sets AI and BI like this. So AI is essentially 
the projection of ci down to this interval one up to m you just translate dilate by ti and q and bi essentially you take elements of ci and you divide out by q but the point is that if you look carefully if we plug in these sets ai and bi into our lambda k counting operator then what you discover is that if there is a k term progression in ai with common difference in bi then by translating and dilating that gives a k term progression along with its common difference in ci in other words a monochromatic k term progression with the common difference which is exactly what we're looking for so that is what we're going to do in order to prove our theorem and in order to ensure that lambda k one ai bi is positive we just use the generalized von neumann argument sketched on the previous slide and we can do this because we have assumed that ai is both dense and uniform that comes from the density and uniformity of ci on this progression of length m common difference q as for bi we can assume you can assume that that's dense because this is the point at which we make a choice of color class it's not true for all the color classes but a careful pigeonhole argument allows you to show that one of the color classes is such that the corresponding bi here is dense and using the generalized von neumann argument on the previous slide gives us our results but now i have to talk a little bit about how do we obtain these q and m and more importantly what happens with non-uniform sets so i've talked a lot about uniform sets these sort of close to random sets but what happens when you have a set that's fairly non-uniform and this is gower's key insight what can we say about these non-uniform sets well intuitively they're biased in some sense so for example the odd numbers are a non-uniform set because for a random set we would expect roughly there to be as many even numbers as odd numbers and indeed if you plug in the definition of if you plug into if you plug odd numbers into the definition of uniformity you see that odd numbers are indeed non-uniform and what Gower showed is that you can quantify this notion of bias in a local in quite a local sense so he proved that if you take a set a which is not epsilon uniform of degree d then it is biased on some fairly long arithmetic regression in other words there's some regression p which is at least some power of n on which the density of a is slightly larger than it is on the whole interval so it's it's previous density plus this uh, little real number eta which is described below and you can see from this power this exponent of 2 to the d plus 1 plus 2 to the d plus 10 this is where kind of the power of r comes in in both gauss result and r result in particular if one could obtain an improvement in gauss local inverse theorem that is you could obtain a larger value of eta then that would immediately give improvements in Gower's bound and R bound. And essentially, this is how we obtain improvements for three term progressions with common difference, because that's essentially what Green and Tau do. Okay, and finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we obtain this Q and M I mentioned in the sketch proof. The idea is essentially to apply Gower's local inverse theorem multiple times. So what we do is we take sets A1 up to AR, and they can be any sets, they don't have to be disjoint, they don't have to be large or small, any kind of sets. And essentially by looking at whether they're uniform or not, and each time one of them is non-uniform, we apply Gower's local inverse theorem to, um, to obtain a sub-progression on which we have more uniformity, then we can show that there exists Q and M with M fairly large, such that each AI is as dense as it could possibly be and epsilon uniform on a progression of length m common difference q and what do i mean by as dense as it could possibly be well for this we define this to, uh, we define this quantity the maximal translate density delta qm of a and this is the largest density that a progression of length m common difference q has on a so in particular this quantity is one if and only if A contains a progression of length M common difference Q. But I won't talk too much about the, I won't talk about this, uh, the proof of this lemma, uh, which is fairly technical, but as you can see, this is where kind of the quantities come in. Applying Gower's local inverse theorem several times gives us the um, double exponential in the color aspect. 
Okay, so that's really all I wanted to talk about. And I'll just mention that the paper on, um, on which our work appears has now been published by the Bulletin of the London Math Society. And um, it's linked in the description below. I would also recommend looking at Tom Sanders' paper, which has now been published in the Proceedings of the Edinburgh Mathematical Society. Um, it appears on First View at the moment. Uh, both of these papers appeared on the archive on the same day, so you can look at them there. Uh, thank you for listening.